By the early 50s, segregation was frayed by the war and torn in spots where the court had acted. The white primary was outlawed. Housing covenants outlawed. Some graduate in law schools were forced to admit blacks. But the court was aware that the big fight was still to come. The schools, K through 12, white children and black in the same classroom. Southerners assumed that if grade school kids uh, were in a desegregated setting, they'd get to know each other, and they'd get to date each other, and then they'd marry to each other. And uh, that was the strongest taboo that the South held. Led by Thurgood Marshall and other young lawyers like Robert Carter, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund was running or aiding cases all over the country. The court picked five and consolidated them into one set of arguments, forever known as Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. As oral arguments approached, people camped outside the building to assure themselves a seat in the courtroom. NAACP lawyers Marshall and Carter were up against a formidable adversary, John W. Davis, a former presidential candidate, making the last of his 140 appearances at the Supreme Court. But his arguments had a familiar ring. Separate wasn't necessarily unequal. Blacks should be happy with the way things were. Didn't states have the right to educate their children as they saw fit? When the three days of arguments were over, Davis was heard to remark, I think we've got it won, five to four, or maybe six to three. The justices scheduled another hearing on the case. But before that could happen, Chief Justice Vincent died of a heart attack. President Eisenhower chose to nominate Earl Warren, formerly the governor of California. On May 17, 1954, there were signs. Some of the justices' wives showed up. Some clerks were tipped off. Then reporters rushed the courtroom. Warren starts off in a bland manner, and you can't tell for a while as he's delivering the opinion what the outcome is going to be. And then he comes to the key line and he says, and we unanimously hold that separate but equal has no place in the Constitution. And it was just electric in the courtroom when he said unanimous. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we unanimously hold that the plaintiffs are deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Plessy B. Ferguson in education is no more, and in practice, Plessy v. Ferguson itself is no more. The era of Jim Crow, constitutionally speaking, is over. This was precisely what we urged them, almost in that language. So it was gratifying to have the, the opinion come down, almost in the language of the argument that we made to them. In 1951, I'd used a plain geometry book that had been used by a white student in 1935. Brown said that that was over. The hand-me-down tubers that I played in the high school band from the white high schools, it said to me that that was ended. And it said to me that at some point, I would not have to travel from Atlanta to Greencastle in Indiana to get an undergraduate degree. That my family, my cousins, my neighbors could go to Georgia Tech and to the University of Georgia. The Supreme Court decision of 1954 was for me the Magna Carta. It was the second emancipation. I was 
in the land of coffee no time there I'm not forgotten Look away, look away, look away Dixieland In Dixie's land where I was born in early on one frosty morning Look away, look away, look away Dixieland Then I wish I was in Dixie, hooray, hooray In Dixie's land I'll take my stand and never die in Dixie Away, away, away outside Good evening, good evening, everyone, and good uh, whatever. You might be watching during the daytime or whatever. Uh, but tonight we are continuing with our series of Growing Up While Black. Uh, today I have three special guests with me uh, that's going to talk about the integration of the Rockdale County Public Schools in 1965. Now, in 2015, I think September 2015, the Citizen Progressive Club had a 50th anniversary celebration for the students that were still alive that integrated the public school system here in Rockdale County uh, at that time, well, about, what, 50 years ago. So now it's been about, uh, what, about 57 years now or whatever. And, and, but they didn't get a chance to talk then. Uh, we didn't allow them the opportunity to tell their story. So tonight we're going to talk to each one of these um, young men. I'm gonna call them young men, and I'm gonna start out with, uh, with the first one. And I want to talk to uh, Dr. Webb, Aubrey Webb, with you, uh, and then we'll go to Ronnie, and then we'll go to Lamar. I want y'all to tell how you were uh, and what grades you were in at the time that. Um, we integrated the school system. So, Aubrey, start with you. Okay, well, I would just like to say good evening. Um, again, I'm Aubrey Webb, and um, in uh, 1965, uh, September, um, I guess it was 17 of us uh, from elementary all the way through high school that um, went into the uh, school system in Rockdale County, and uh, for us, we went to Rockdale County High School. Uh, the first day, um, that now, just, I just, just, just tell me what grade you were in at that time and how old okay. you were. That's all I want to know I, right I now. Was in, I was in the 12th grade and I was 17 years old. Okay. All right, Ronnie. I believe I was in the 10th grade and I was 16 years old at that point in time. Okay, let me correct you. You were in the 11th grade. <laughs> and there's a possibility, yeah. I was about to say there's a possibility I was in the 11th grade. Okay. If the, if the All right, Lamar. Were, if the schools were integrated in 65, I graduated in 67. Yeah. Okay. So, Lamar? 
Uh, I was 14, and I was ninth grade. Okay. All right. Good. So we got a ninth grader, 11th grader, and a 12th grader. All right. Let me just kind of refresh your memory because I had to look this up. I didn't know this, but here was the uh, the board members at the time that y'all integrated the, the high school. It was James Miller was the chairman of the board uh, of education. Fred Corley Jr. was the vice president, and the other members was Tom Britt, George Elliott, Roy Hammonds, Roland uh, Reagan, and Erwin uh, Smith Jr. And the uh, superintendent of the um, of the board at that time was uh, J. H. House, which the um, the elementary school now is named after, and and what have you. Uh, this is kind of a little bit of a, a, a deviation from it, but I want to want to ask this question: Do either one of you have any idea what the number one TV show was when y'all integrated the school system? The number one TV show. I have no idea. <laughs> I can't tell you. I, I, I don't either. I don't have a clue. Okay, would you believe? That Bonanza was the number one TV show in 1965, 66 school year. The second was Guma Powell. All right. Okay. And okay. Uh, so I won't go into the whole list and everything, but uh, the round out the top 10 was uh, Batman. And, um, and, and that was the, the and so y'all can go Google that later to find out <laughs> all, uh, all of the, uh, the top. Uh, TV shows that were going on during that time. Now, what I want to look at was, uh, I consider you guys as trailblazers. Y'all are trailblazers. I, I know that I've only got three of you here. I think I always said about, it was 17 of you, and I tried to get some other people to get involved, but uh, they, their schedules didn't permit them to uh, allow them to, um, to come on and be a part of this uh, broadcast. Um Let's go back to some of the beginning of this. Um, how did y'all get selected? How did you get involved uh, in terms of um, being a part of this group, this trailblazer group? Now, uh, let's start with you, Lamar. Who was the first somebody that brought it to your attention? Then we'll go run it in, Aubrey. Uh, who was the first somebody approach your parents and approach you? And what did your parents say uh, when they was trying to get you to do this? Uh, I think the uh, progressive club pretty much um, uh, decided who would go. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but Kenny Hall, he, uh, he 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 approached my parents about me uh, going there. You know. Okay. Uh, All right. What uh, what about you, Ronnie? Um, I remember the most important person was Kenneth Hall. Uh, okay. He, he was very influential, and uh, Miss what's her name? Essie Robinson. Okay. Yeah, Essie. Mm -hmm. That's her name, Lamar. Yeah, yeah so Miss Essie. That's right. Yeah, yeah, Miss Essie. Yeah, but she actually lives on North Main Street, and yep. she had an Etzel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if, you know, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, it was it was a white Etzel. Etzel. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, Aubrey. Now, who was the first somebody uh, ask you about it? Or talk to your parents about it. Well, I would say it was a couple. It was a couple of people. Um, you know, like everybody said, you know, Mr. Hall was, uh, um, you know, he was the paper man, and you know, he knew me all my life. So, uh, and my parents. So, Mr. Hall and also uh, Mr. George uh, Levitt Senior. Okay. She now, I think uh, I was uh, I was only fifteen years old when this took place. It was fifth. I was fifteen years old. Um, and I don't remember all the uh, the details and everything about you know how did it happen, but I was later told uh, that there were a lot of uh, uh, I would say kitchen meetings or something to make this smoothly uh, go as smoothly as it uh, as as it did go. Because to be honest, we didn't have a whole lot of problems in um, in Rockdale County when we integrated the school system. So. Um, I think the powers to be, along with the Progressive Club, played a major role in making it as as easy as it was. Now, Aubrey, I want to ask you this question. You you transferred and you were a senior, senior in high school. You only had one year to go and you left 
Rockdale, I mean, uh, J.P. Carr, to go to Rockdale County High School. Now, um, what was that like? What did you, what was on your mind? What did you think about that when you and and you weren't afraid to you know risk your senior year uh, going to school? So, kind of walk me through what that was like. You know, leaving a school that you have been in for eleven years, and then the last year of your high school year, you decided. Well, your parents did. Uh, to send you over to Rockdale County High School. So what was that really like? Well, I sort of look at it like this. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted That was my dream. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be a, a pilot. And pretty much what I've done in life, um, it's pretty much, it was the way uh, God wanted me to, me to go. Uh, I had a lot of, I knew everybody, you know, like Ronnie, mm -hmm. Lamar, all of us, you know, we knew our, we knew parents, we knew everybody. And so it was like, um, if I was going to go on, a lot of people said, okay, you're going to, this school is equal to the senior years equal to like your freshman year in college. And they said, you know, if I was you, I would, I really wouldn't, I would ask a lot to give up to go over there and uh, to go there. And, you know, you don't, you know, the unknown, you don't know what's out there. But my philosophy was one, if I'm going to compete, I may as well go on and get ready to compete. And so, um, you know, Veronica and I, we were the two seniors, you know, again, like uh, Lamar and, um, you know, who else do we have there with us? Uh, we had Ronnie, we had uh, Jerome, Gail Flanagan. And um, I think that was about it for the high school for us, right, uh, Ronnie and Lamar? No, there was, se there was several more. Uh, oh, yeah, well, but Mary, that, that's like, like the Baker, you know, like Marilyn uh -huh. Baker and all. Yeah. But, and so I was like the oldest guy, and I felt that, you know, being in, in there, that, um, you know, hey, let's do it. And I, that's the kind of person I am. So I got in there, and um, and I had, I had had some great teachers. I'll tell anybody, if you go to comparing, uh, you know, going uh, to the teachers that I had at J.P. Carr and look at the ones I had at Rockdale, I would say pound to pound, uh, the teachers that I had at J.P. Carr and the love of the community and all the people that I grew up around, uh, it prepared me. And so we got in there and we rolled. You know, we had to look out for each other and we did what we had to do and then run in. Lamar, you know, I wasn't in, 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 in class with Lamar, but we was all, we would see each other. And uh, it was a good thing to do that as we went well, through. So, well, Ronnie, you... Um you played in a band at J.P. Carr, and uh, I, I think you started a band, an uh, R&B band, when when, when y'all were in high school. I think it was called R&B and the what? It was called R&B and the Soul Singers. All right. Now, when you got over to Rockdale, did you play in the marching band or anything over there? I did. Okay. So you um, you played Dixit when you was over that end, right? Oh yes, <laughs> of course I did. Okay, all right. So what was that? What was that experience like playing in that band and playing uh, Dixie and um, and you and you you, you did, never played that. That I, let me just preface that by saying back when we were in school, every time they showed us a movie, the movies always came on with that Dixie song on it. So what was that like? performing over there in the band, uh, playing Dixie? Or did you even think about, you know, what that meant back at, at the time that you were uh, approximately 16 years old? Did that ever cross your mind? It, it, it did not. Okay. Okay. And, uh, I, I've actually lost your screen. I'm working on a project. Hold up a second. Let me see if I can find you back. Uh, uh, where are you? Where are you? Nope. I can't find you. Hold on. Okay. okay. Well, I'll come back. I'm gonna, let me go to Lamont. Lamont, you were an athlete. And uh, I think you, if I remember correctly, you had probably played one year of basketball at J.P. Carr because that was the only sport we had. We didn't have football. We didn't have baseball. We didn't have track. And you had played, I believe, one year of um, a basketball at J.P. Carr in your eighth grade year, and then you went to Rockdale, and you was a still an athlete. I know you played multiple sports, but I want to kind of just concentrate on you playing on the basketball team. Uh, I want you to tell us 
Uh, after you got on the basketball team, were you on the starting five? Uh, if not, or when you got in your first game, what was that like um, to go into that game and being probably the only black person that was going to be on the court at all? So what was that like? Take us back and just kind of walk us through what that was like that first night you got a chance to play or start or whatever. Um, the first night... I was coming off the bench, but I, I knew I should have been starting, but, you know, because I was <laughs> a lot better than two or three of the guys, you know. Uh, but I um, come off the bench and uh, did really well. And and um, I think the first game that I was put in a position, uh, two free throws at the end of the game to win the game. And, and I think I made both of them. And um, but Rotter has never had a good basketball team. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. That's right. Had never had. I don't know if they ever had been five hundred before. So um, you know they kind of they you know they gave me a, you know they clapped and you'd say you know in a good game something like that. But that was mo mostly at the first game. You know. Now what? How did the how did the, the team members? Uh, I won't. I don't need you to call any of your names or anything. But just how did the team members at that time receive you? Well, um, I think they received me pretty well. It, it, it might have been one or two that I didn't feel comfortable, you know, being around or after after we leave the court, you know. Uh, but overall, you know. They, they received me pretty well, you know. Um, okay, well, as, as a 14 year old, were you afraid? Um, and um, did you have any fear in, in playing ball? Uh, I want you to tell the people, uh, you know, how you felt. Were you concerned? Did you realize that you were making history? You were a trailblazer? Did you think about any of that while you were uh, playing and everything? Uh, no, I didn't. I um, actually, uh, once I got on the basketball court and football field, you know, that was my sweet spot. You know, I mean, that's where I, that's where I was comfortable at. You know, uh, so and that kind of you tune the noise out. Uh, you know, you don't hear you don't hear the sound anymore. You know, so. Okay. Now, what position did you play on the team? Uh, I played guard and forward. Okay. Okay. I want to, Ronnie, I'm going to come back to you, but I want to tell uh, this story. Um, and I don't, Aubrey, I don't know whether you remember this or not, but I remember the first basketball game that you took me to because you were like two grades ahead of me. Um, and the gym at that time was up where the Board of Education office, central office is now. And what I remember is uh, it had two big double steel doors. And um, and I remember when they opened that door, uh, all I saw was white people inside that gym. That's all I saw. And I remember asking Aubrey the question, are you sure it's okay for us to go in this gym? <laughs> and he being my, you know, my big brother, uh, I trusted his uh, ability. I, you know, I, I'm surprised that my mother even let me go uh, to the game in the first place. But uh, he assured me that it was going to be safe <laughs> for us to go into that game. All right. So, like I said, when them doors open and I saw, I didn't see, no, uh, uh, Ronnie, I didn't see you. I didn't see none of the other uh, uh, trailblazers in there. All I saw was white people, and I the only other thing I remember about that that game was the fact that that gym had posts, wooden posts or something in it, and, and depending on where you were sitting, you had to look around the posts to watch the game. And uh, but let me just go on record by saying that nothing happened, nothing transpired. Uh, but I'm gonna be honest, as a 15 year old, I was afraid. I was really afraid uh, to go into that gym. Now, Ronnie, you had was going to say something, and we kind of moved on. Uh, did you find what you, you was looking for? 
Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Let, let, let me go to another course. And I think this is going, I think going to probably pertain to Aubrey. And I think you and Ronnie was in this class. Uh, if I remember correctly, y'all took a class and y'all had a teacher that kept making the test every week harder and harder. Now, what was that class, Aubrey? U.S. History, huh? U.S. History, 1865. Okay. You know, All right. Yeah. And, and so every week, if I understood right, the teacher kept making the, the test harder and harder because he wanted to prove a point that black people could not learn. Is that right? That's right. Okay. And so what did you do in that class? Ronnie and I, we hit the books and we hit them hard. <laughs> and, and I got the, I got, and we, we, we could make a hundred. And so we, he finally <laughs> acknowledged that some of us had the ability to learn, but I got one other one. I got to plug in here. Okay. Ronnie and I used to wear shades and he used to hate that. He said, I don't know why it is. You soul brothers. <laughs> 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 After coming this class, he with the, with the cloud and you got shades on now. If you ain't got, if you don't, if you don't have a subscription, Prescription, then you ain't gonna be able to wear those shades. Well, guess what? One and I both had a prescription, and we ended up being soul brothers wearing our shades. Okay, now for, uh, for, for the record, I want everybody to understand that at that time, those glasses were called tinted lens or tinted glasses, and uh, so it, 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 it was a, a style, and most of all of us had, a, I don't know how much they called, but they most of all of us, uh, they were stylish glasses. They were stylish <laughs> at the time. And just about everybody had a pair of them, and uh, and we wore those. Now, Aubrey, I want to go back to something that you just said, that um, the teacher was trying to prove that black people could not learn. And I, I think you just said that finally he admitted, after you and Ronnie kept acing the test and what have you, that he finally said something to the effect like, I guess you people can learn. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, so um, I would say that that most of the kids that went over uh, to integrate the school system um, were probably pretty bright young men and women. Now, I do realize, and I don't want to bring up their names and stuff, there were some who went to integrate the schools who could not make it, and they had to end up coming back uh, to J.P. Carr or... And I'm not saying they were, you know, academically not able to make it, but I guess the, the pressure and, and all of that that uh, took part in this. Um, now, Lamar, you said you you had made a comment before we went online about Ronnie telling the story about something. So why don't you ask Ronnie to, to address that story that you were telling before we came online? Oh, um, okay. I, was, uh, I was talking about I guess it might have been the first couple of weeks that we were there at school, and every morning, that, it was quite a breezeway. Go oh, right, Ronnie. Um, I, I actually recall going in, 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 in Kenneth Hall's car, and, and, and there were all of us on the back seat. The car it was totally filled. And uh, the very first day of school, we got up out of the car at the breezeway. And I, I recall kids being in the breezeway trying to block us from going into the school. Uh, and that was a, a frightening experience. Uh, and it was something that I hadn't expected. But, but, but the thing that comes to my mind the most is we had a group for white kids who would block our way every morning, every morning, okay? And by, by this point, Lamar was a superstar. <laughs> he, uh -huh. he was a superstar. And, and every morning, when those white kids would block our way, instead of us walking through them, we walk around the breezeway. And, and this particular morning, it was raining, okay? <laughs> I mean, it was coming out pretty good. So so we started to walk around, and Lamar said, I'm not walking around <laughs> in that rain. 
and, and I'm not sure if he hit this kid with, with his fist, I don't remember, or if, he, or if he hit him with something, or, or if he pushed him. But, but whatever he did, the, the kid who was blocking away was frightened. And, and when this kid was pushed or, or hit or whatever, everybody else just kind of. So in other words, he got rid of the bully and uh, then everybody else kind of just fell in line there, right? Oh, yeah. Now, uh, y'all remember was blocked. They were huh? there this morning. Uh, I don't think they was there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they were either, Lamar. They got that. Mm -hmm. Okay, now did they did they have any uh, law enforcement over there when y'all were going to school? Uh, when y'all you, you first started the the uh, the protect you guys, or was any? Uh, and who, by the way, who was the principal of the school at that time? I believe it was Mr. House, wasn't it? No, no Mr. Huttman. Huttman. Mr. Huttman. Huttman. Mr. Huttman. 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 Okay. Huttman. Uh -huh. Yeah, Mr. Huttman. That's you know, the, the guys call him Bulldog. You know, that, that was the inside joke. Uh -huh. Mr. Huttman. Bulldog. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. are there some other incidents or stories that y'all want to share um, about that experience and, and whatever, because I got one more that I want to ask that might be a little bit controversial, but I'm going to let y'all sh share some things. And then I want to ask this, this kind of controversial question. Okay. Well, one of them that I would like to share is one, the first day going in, we went in on the, the, you know, I guess the backside, you know, there's between the gym and I guess that was one interest to go in. So I was riding like with Mr. Levitt and, uh, you know, and, and also, you know, along with my father and all of us, we were dropped off right there. And there was a gentleman <clears throat> that was standing. That was the first day he was standing in front of the doors. Uh, going to be like uh, somebody else we know from Alabama. Basically, we wasn't going to go into school. And uh, uh, the sheriff at that time, he was up there to make sure it didn't happen to us. And uh, he said, he asked him, he said, uh, what are you why why are you standing up here in front of these doors? He said, Well, are uh, these kids not gonna go to school with us? And uh, not they can they can't come to school over here, they got their own school. And uh a chef at that time he said, Well, he said, uh uh they yeah, they going in here today. Say, say, you know, say uh we don't make sense for us to have two school systems anyway, as small as Rockdale County is. He said, But uh what what were you planning on doing today? And he said, he said, Well, he said Go on and get in your old raggedy truck and go on. Let us go on and have school. And that was it. And so, so we went he was on. not even a student at the school? Oh, no. This was an older white gentleman oh, that was going to okay. stand up there and keep us from going inside of the school. And, you know, and the principal was standing up there and he had the door open for us to come on in. And he said so he wasn't going in that school. He was going to so block you're telling, you're telling me in 1965 mm -hmm. that a white sheriff in Rockdale County told another white man that you guys were going into the school. Yes, sir. He told okay. him. And, uh, you know, he's gone now, but I had a lot of respect for him. And I think one of the things that made it nice for us, in a sense, a lot of our parents grew up or our grandmothers, grandfathers worked for a lot of the uh, our other brothers um, in, 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 in Rockdale County. So when it came to that, it was like this gentleman grew up with my dad over in um, over there in, in the Double Spring Settlement. OK. There. So okay. it was like he was there, you know, my dad, Mr. Mr. Levitt, and he was there standing, making sure there wasn't nobody going to mess with us as kids getting in, going in. And um, so, like I said, we went on in the school and that was that. And then uh, one other occasion that um, uh, one gentleman, we went to class and. He asked a question uh, to me, how much money was the NAACP paying all of us to go to school with them? And my reply back to him was nothing. I was like, Jesus, hey, I don't need to tell you what's going on. I'm, I'm here to get my education. And that's my purpose. That's my mission. So, you know, I didn't say anything back to him, but he just asked that question, wanted to know how much was the NAACP paying us to go to school. Then one other incident you know, like in most cases, uh, how many students did, did Lamar use pretty much in most of your classes by yourself, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, so I, that was the same way. Yeah, go on. Tell it, you know, sort of 
tell about your class because in mo in most of my classes, uh, you know, I have Veronica in chemistry, and I had um, Ronnie and Jerome in U.S. history, but then like in my math classes, I was in there all by myself, and uh, you know, same way with mechanical drawing. So, you know, sort of relay on some of your experiences. Well, it was uh, first year was really uncomfortable, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I don't I don't think it's about 25, 30 kids in the class and mm -hmm. every time you look on all eyes on you. You know, mm -hmm. you know so that was kind of uh, uncomfortable. I don't I don't I don't I wouldn't say it was frightening, but um mm -hmm. I was uncomfortable, you know. Right. Well, let me ask you this, Lamar. Do you think looking back over it now? Uh, do you think because you were an athlete that you might have been treated a little bit better than the rest of the kids that do, or you think that didn't really make a difference? Uh, I think it made a difference after my freshman year. Uh, from sophomore to senior year, I, I think it made a difference. You know, uh, where your freshman year, when you're walking down the hallway, nobody speaks to you. Uh, but sophomore and junior year, you know, um, they start speaking to you softly, but waving at you. And I think in my junior year, when we went to the state tournament um, basketball, did all everybody want to be your friend? You know, at that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, now, Ronnie, I know Aubrey is a social butterfly. I know you. You are <laughs> a social butterfly. You, you. Um, I know you made a a, a lot of friends and stuff. But now here's the, the difficult question. I, you know, and I want you to set the record straight tonight on this. Uh, there's a urban legend um, that at some point, I guess it was uh, the fresh, the first year y'all were over there, there was a dance that they had at the school and you danced with one of the young ladies at the school. Now, is that a true statement? That's true. Okay. Now, I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute, but I want just for the record so people understand that particular incident caused a change in the social structure at, I know at J.P. Carr and I think at Rockdale County High School, 1966, they did not have a prom. I know they didn't have it at J.P. Carr. 1967, they didn't have a prom. Yeah. And then they reinstated it 1968, the year that I graduated. So I guess both schools had it. I know we had a prom in 1968, but there was no prom in 1966, and there was no prom in 1967. So now running, what happened as a result to you? Did you get suspended from school? What happened uh, after that incident? Did they stop y'all? You just tell us what happened at that particular incident. They, I don't recall who the principal was, and I'm not sure if the principal was the one who stopped us. But uh, I, I walked over to her and asked her if she wanted to dance. And it wasn't a dance where we were holding each other. We, we were about five to eight feet apart. Uh -huh. okay. I mean, we didn't even hold hands. We were just dancing at the same time. And, uh, and I asked her to dance. And I don't remember who it was, but somebody came over and said that that, that couldn't happen, that I couldn't dance with her. Uh, and at that point, I was told that I had to leave. And that was probably, that was probably in, now, no, now that I think about it, now that I think about it, I'd already left high school. It was it was in 1971, and, okay. and I and I had come back. Oh, okay. okay. Huh? I think he was, I think he was a junior. You was your your junior year. You think I was a junior? Yeah, you was a junior. Okay, okay, but uh, but, but I, I recall the incident happening. Okay. <laughs> But now I do recall in '71 when I came back because I carried Marilyn Baker to the prom, 
and 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 for for some reason there was another white girl who asked me to dance or asked her to dance and, and I was escorted out of the gym. Wow. True story. I I was escorted out of the gym and I left at that point I was living in Atlanta and I know I was in college then because I wouldn't stand in kindness anymore. And uh, on my way home, the 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 kindness city police actually stopped me. Okay, and uh, and the officer who stopped me said that he had had a, a call that I had stolen something or broken in somebody's house. I'm not sure what his reason was. So he stopped me, and I'm quite sure he stopped me because. The principal had told him that I, I was escorted out of dance and I was dancing with this white girl. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at that point, uh, for some reason, the, the officer who came, I asked him, he asked me if he could search my car. And, and, and I told him that I didn't feel comfortable with that and I asked him to call Mr. Levitt. Mr. Levitt was on the police force. And, uh, and he, he came when Mr. Levitt came I didn't have a problem with them searching my car. And of course, they didn't find any drugs or any alcohol or anything that was stolen. But uh, I would not let them search my car until Mr. Levitt came to witness. All right. Well, that, that's, that's an interesting story. And, uh, and you know, because I thought when you were dancing with the girl and stuff, y'all were like, you know, all wrapped up. And for the record, Ronnie could dance. Uh, he mm -hmm. could. He didn't have two left feet, so back in the day, I don't know what he could do today, but uh, back then he could really, <laughs> really dance and everything. But I want to I want to just bring up this, and some of y'all uh, probably remember this. Um, you said that a Kanye's police officer, I won't call his name, uh, stopped you. I don't know whether this was the guy or not, but the guy that I'm talking about was a kind of a tall, big guy, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know whether this was true or not, but it's my understanding that this city of Conyers police officer could not read and write. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so when he would stop somebody and if he gave him a ticket, he would let them fill the ticket out. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and they would put his name on the ticket. And, <laughs> and uh, because he couldn't, he didn't know, uh, I guess until he got back to the police station, he would give him the ticket. <clears throat> and, uh, they would uh, say, you know, I guess they would just throw it in the trash because they knew it wasn't nothing they could do about it. And then y'all remember that we had uh, an organization at J.P. Carr, and I think it was called, was it called New Farmers of America? Was that what it was called, Aubrey? That's uh, right, the New Farmers of America, yeah. Okay, and we had a little membership card, and y'all know back then we didn't have our pictures on our driver's license, so he was told that when he would stop people, Sometimes they would give him that car and he thought it was a driver's license, a legitimate driver's license. And he would he would let them go. Now, um, let me kind of throw this in and, and uh, just for the record, Aubrey and I had a grandfather that owned a, a shoe shop in Old Town Conyers. Oh, yeah. And, um, so probably 95 to 98% of his business was probably white. Would you agree to that, Aubrey? Yes. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. <laughs> so it gave Aubrey and I an advantage in some cases to know a lot of the white community people because they came in the shoe shop and they knew we were Robert Williams' grandson. So to some degree, that may have helped us in terms of how we were able to survive in and Conyers, because I think if I would ask every one of you that integrated the school system, probably every one of you would have a, a different story than the three of you have, and the other 17 or however many, well, 50 or 14 of you it was, would probably have a, another story or have a different experience in terms of how they were treated. Now, what I want to do is, because uh, we've uh, been for a while, and I know maybe that you uh, May, I may not have asked all the questions that you wanted to answer, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to start um, with Aubrey, since Aubrey can, I know he can talk, and I, I think that's probably one reason why we didn't let y'all talk back in 2015, because Aubrey would have been up there all day. Yeah, but everybody, I want to, full disclosure, Aubrey and I are first cousins, so I can pick at him oh, like yeah. that and, oh, and yeah. talk 
<laughs> talk later, but he's a talker. Okay, so Aubrey, what I want all of you, starting with you, what I want you to kind of do is to kind of uh, summarize what lessons that you learned uh, from being um, a trailblazer and um, how have you used that experience in life to talk to other kids who have gone into, or uh, people who have gone into experiences that were uncomfortable with them? So I'm gonna start with you, don't, don't take a long time, just give me a few points and uh, and everything. Don't give me the military version of it, just give me some high, <laughs> the highlights and stuff. So you start off and then I go to Ronnie, then, then Lamar, okay? What did you well, learn? First thing I would like to say is one, I would have to give credence to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for letting me be born uh, in a community of people that believed in, in Jesus Christ. So I pretty much knew all of the uh, families, uh, black families in Kanyas and the inspiration that they gave me and pushed me that we could do better. Like Miss Kara Collins, uh, again, Miss Essie Robertson, you know, uh, all of the gill straps and, you know, the, the churches, you know, all of them, all of the, the, the black churches that I was affiliated with and all of the families that made a difference. That made me be who I was. And I had accepted Jesus Christ at a young age of three years old. So I, I, I was I was focused. I knew where I was and I was blessed to have awesome teachers from first grade, Miss Ellen Dupree. And I could go through every last one of them uh, up to that point in the ones that helped us like Mr. Walker. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Thomas, um, you know, when we went over there, they supported us and they made sure that we wouldn't fail. And uh, so I appreciate them. And the ones that I had as teachers there, I appreciate those, Mrs. Bird who taught me chemistry, Mrs. Lane who taught me pre-calculus trigonometry, um, Mr. Horton, even though he challenged the heck out of Ronnie. Jerome and I, we we lived up and, and proved to him that we could, uh, you know, withstand Mother Archer, who taught me, um, you know, a government. So, uh, and also I had one that taught me in, uh, engineering drawing. So it was a positive experience for me. I, it, it helped me to prepare me for the rest of my life. And so um, I, you know, I had one run in, uh, one guy like what um, Lamar was saying, um, he used to beat us up every day going to Mr. Cope's class for English literature and grammar. And that was Veronica and I go in there and he would knock me down every day. So this, he would harass other people in the school building. And uh, Jerome, I think he probably harassed everybody. But at the end of the day, uh, one day he knocked me down. And uh, that, was the, that was the call. I said, I'm the oldest, in my mind, I said, I'm the oldest guy here. I represent my people and uh, we, you know, we're not gonna have this uh, going on because this has to stop just like what Lamar said he did and so what I did is when I got up I, I didn't weigh with 123 pounds soaking wet but I, I knocked him out and I figured that that was it for me uh, I thought that uh, I was getting ready to get expelled my parents and everybody else in the community would be headed that way to get all the way up but uh, after that you know and the kids was telling them to leave me alone and that's what they said all through the whole time and they was he was harassing people throughout that school but Ultimately, after that, we had a little similar, we had a piece in calm. So um, the, the sad part about it, um, this person, um, you know, they lost their life in a car accident. And all of us that knew him said, um, like Moms Mabley, did good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ryder. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I can say in general that, that, that I'm thankful for those people who encouraged us and supported us, especially people like Kenneth Hall, mm -hmm. uh, S.C. Robinson, uh, Jerome Levitt's father, uh, I forgot his name. He, he, he was a- George, he, Mr. George Levitt, everybody called him Sheba. You know, so. Sheba, mm -hmm. George Levitt. I mean, they were extremely supportive and, and, and active in the community. The entire, experience was extremely challenging and we did have some challenges challenges like the, the situation told you that the kid was breaking was blocking the, the breezeway but uh, Lamar took care of that um, uh, and the, the fact that you could be in a classroom and people would call your names and they, they would hit you with their books or throw uh, straws or uh, nothing that could harm you 
but it was it was just aggravating. Um, and it, it's ironic that you mentioned that I played in the band, and, and I did play Dixie, okay. <laughs> and, and, and and enjoy playing it. And and for some reason at that point it, it didn't bother me. And I was 16, 16 years old, and it, it didn't bother me that I was in a band playing my saxophone and cymbals. I was a big cymbal player. And uh, when it got to, I wish I was in Dixie, bam. And I would take my cymbals and twirl them, and they would cheer me. And it was just an exciting part of, of my life. Uh, I, I would trade that time for anything in my life. I'm reaching up on my desk. I'm going to show you. What's at the top of my desk? <clears throat> Everybody see that? Uh huh. Yes, can't sir. read it, but we can see it. Huh? Can't read it, but we can see it. <laughs> of course, you can read that. <laughs> it was the Citizen Progressive Club. Rockdale presents the Ronnie Pierce and Courage Award, 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. 50th anniversary volunteer integration. Rockdale County, uh, I'm trying to read it backwards. Uh, but but this, this is something I'm proud of, and I keep it close to me, and it's sitting right up here up on my desk. And uh, I really uh, appreciate the, the people that were responsible for it. I think this came from the Progressive Club, if I'm right. not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. uh, but this is okay. important to me. Okay. Well, Ronnie, you know, uh, you mentioned playing the cymbals. I want to tell a story about you uh, that you may not remember. I don't remember how you were when you first came to uh, J.P. Carter to go to school, but I remember you had a swing or something like bicycle, a uh, three-swing uh, bicycle. And one uh, May Day parade, you were dressed up like a clown, and you were riding that bike. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if you remember that or not, but anyway, that's – one of the things that I one of the first memories I have of you. Okay, Lamar, tell us, you know, what you learned from that experience, but you know, especially being an athlete and um, and uh, people, you know, talk about jocks, you know, being special and all that kind of stuff. So, what life lessons have you had, and you know, what were you able to share with your uh, your son and your grandson about, you know, your experiences, you know, and how did you use what you learned during that experience in life? Uh, now, well, um, I can remember one thing I'm kind of grateful for is, you know, where I come from. Um, I can remember when I was like 12 and 13, I used to walk down to football fair uh, by Miss Maryham and look through the fence, you know, watch me every Friday night and go down and look through the fence. And my senior year, I was co-captain of the football team. My wow. senior year, I was captain of the basketball team. And I can remember going to Stone Mountain. That was known as Ku Klux Klan country. That's right. Right. And I remember um, having people to be, be by my side at all times. And uh, I think it was like Gus Barksdale and a few more guys, my friends, you know. And um, I, I was really thankful. And, and I, I remember coming to Stone Mountain, um, they stopped at a burger, little burger place, and, and they came to me and said, stay on the bus. What do you want? We'll bring it to you. You know. Uh, so, but People that became lifetime friends, like, uh, you know, around Congress now. So um, I'm grateful for them. I'm Coach Stroud and Mr. Hardrick. I, I know, know y'all remember him. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's who I had to go talk to. So, so, you know, but it was a good experience and I cherish it, you know. Well, you know, um, I know and, and I want to congratulate y'all for the fact that y'all were trailblazers and the fact that you uh, were brave enough to do the things that you all did. And um, and I'm grateful for that, that y'all paved the way for, you know, a black kids um, going to Rockdale County High School Heritage in Salem now. 
uh, don't know the history. Um, and for those that are watching, I just want um, everybody to know that in 1965, it was a volunteer integration process. And so uh, some went in 1965, some went the next year, 66, 67, 68. And 1969 was the last year uh, that J.P. Carr had a high school. So the class of 1969 was the last year that J.P. Carr had a high school. And um, after that, the, uh, the fall of 1969, uh, Lamar, I guess that would have been your, uh, no, that was after, uh, after you had graduated. Uh, they in, in, uh, did total integration of the uh, Rockdale County public school system. And y'all remember when y'all that JP uh, car, y'all know that we had uh, hand-me-down books. They already, somebody already had used the books from, from the white school. And I guess when they were out of date or whatever, they gave them to us to, uh, to have and, and what have you. But I can't That's emphasize enough, the people that were heavily involved in, in, in the black community, uh, like Mr. Kenneth Hall, Mr. George Leverett, Sr., uh, Miss Essie Robertson and and I'm sure Coach Stroud was involved in, but there were a lot of black people that were involved in doing the negotiations uh, and making all this possible. And 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 one of the things I know all of you can you kind of said in certain ways that you had a lot of family support, you had community support to help you in that situation. Um, I'm going to close with a couple of stories and then uh, we'll get out of here, but. Arbor and I, uh, when we were growing up, we always played together every day and everything. So when he got to Rockdale High School, um, he didn't come out the house after school. And so my mother got upset because I didn't have any homework to do. I didn't, I didn't, you know, it didn't take me that much, that long to do whatever a little bit I had to do. And, uh, and she just made me pick up a book, read or do something. To make it look like I was studying, because Aubrey stayed in the house all day after he got home. He wouldn't come out. And so he made it tough for me. Uh, I had to study when I didn't want to study because he stayed in, the, stayed in the house and studied all the time. And so mother made me pick up a book and study. The final story, I think, is my final story. These people that I told you about, um, and I'm going to read them again. James Miller, Chairman, Fred Corley, uh, Vice Chairman, Tom Britt, George Elliott, um, Roy Hammonds, Ronald uh, Reagan, Erwin Smith Jr., and J.H. House, uh, who was the superintendent. Those were the board members. And he was, for some reason or another, in 1966, the year that Auburn graduated, he and Veronica graduated to be the first black students who graduate from Rockdale County High School. For some reason or another, somebody, I don't know who it was, the powers to be, set the graduations up for J.P. Carr and Rockdale County High School on the same night at the same time. Now, why is that such a big deal to me? Because here's my cousin, my first cousin, my brother, making history by graduating from Rockdale County High School, and because y'all left, running you and Aubrey, y'all were tenor saxophone players at J.P. Carr, I was the only tenor saxophone player left. Danny was not playing tenor sax at that time. By the time he was, uh, he was uh, playing baritone saxophone. So I was the only tenor saxophone player left at the J.P. Carr band. So Mr. Hudson, Mr. David Hudson, our band director told me if I didn't play that night of the graduation, I was going to get put out of the band. Uh -huh. So I had a choice. <laughs> do I go to J.P. Carr and play in the graduation at J.P. Carr or do I go to Rockdale County High School graduation, see Aubrey make history and get kicked out of the band? All right. I'm 15 years old. So I go home and I tell my parents. And for 15 years, Willie Sattler and Eddie May Sattler had always made my decisions for me. But when it came to this situation, they said, you decide what you're going to do. So here I am, 15-year-old. So here's the choice. 
watch Aubrey make history and get put out of the band or miss Aubrey making history and play in the band. So they tell me, you make your decision. You decide what you want to do. So how did I handle this as a 15-year-old? I go to Aubrey and I tell him what this deal was. And what Aubrey said, because he was my big brother, he said, go ahead and play at the graduation at J.P. Carr. And um, I understand why you can't be there that night. And to my knowledge, Aubrey has never held that against me uh, that I didn't show up for his graduation. Now, oh, yeah. looking back at it now, Mr. Hudson wouldn't have put me out of the band. Uh, <laughs> I don't believe he would have, but he scared the crap out of me. And um, But I still kind of got this thing about my parents letting me make that decision when they done made all the other decisions for me uh, in my life. But that was one big one big decision for me. And it was hard because I wanted to be there to witness that history. And I just want to say to you guys right now, thank y'all again for taking part tonight out of the schedule uh, to be on, uh, to be interviewed. And I know that when people watch this, they're going to be thinking there are a lot of other questions Sattler should have asked them and, and what have you. But those are the things that I thought about. And um, I just, again, I want to thank God for each one of you. And I, I, I thank you for setting, along with the others, setting the path and opening up the doors. And I thank God for the, all of the uh, seniors that are passed on now that were behind this because people who move into Rockdale County now don't know the history of a lot of things that took place and how black people were working together with the white community because the Progressive Club was a liaison between the white powers to be and the black community. And that, that's what has never been a political organization, it's more for a civic organization, but it was heavily involved in this integration process. But again, my brothers, I want to say thank you again for tuning, I mean, being online tonight uh, to tell your story. I know there's more that you could tell. And I want to encourage you, tell your children and grandchildren this story. Let them know when they're discouraged when they feel like they just cannot make it, how you were able to endure at such a young age. Uh, Aubrey was, what, 17 years old. Ronnie, you were like 16. And then Lamar, you were 14 years old. I mean, when you think about it, that's just remarkable. Now, you think about a child that's at that age, at your age at that time, and you think about what some of the children that you know that's 14, that. 17 years old, that's 16 years old, will be able to endure what you were able to endure. And I know someone said, I wouldn't have put up with all of that. But you got to understand the times. And I thank you for being brave enough to do it because I know I was too scared to go. So I stayed at J.P. Carr. So I didn't go. <laughs> but because I was scared. I'm going to be honest. I was scared. I, I, I don't even know. I, I think my parents were probably scared too. So I don't even think they... They even asked me to do it, thing, but uh, I was scared to do it, and I probably would not have done well uh, over there because I would have probably been intimidated at, at uh, 15 years old. I, I'm sure I probably would. But you guys, thank y'all so much, man, and uh, and y'all be blessed, and y'all stay safe, and uh, thank you again so much, and, and y'all can just say good night to everybody. To everybody say goodbye. Hey, I, I just like to say, Aubrey, I'm impressed at your age, and you and I are the same age. So you can recall the, the teacher's name, the, the coach. <laughs> I mean, I am mean, yeah. impressed with that, my brother. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just like to say this. I would like to uh, throw in something for all of us that uh, made it happen, and one especially to my classmate Veronica Luster Flanagan. Um, I was touched because we were supposed to have the 50th anniversary and Veronica didn't make it. Um, and, you know, she she uh, passed away on the operating table. And then one other classmate that we had that cut the path and welcomed Veronica and I as seniors was uh, Regina Nybert. And we lost her after our 25th 
our reunion. But I'll never, we will never forget Regina Nybert, Veronica and I, for her welcoming us to the class of 66 when we first, our first day at Rockdale County High School. All right. All right. Lamar, you got anything else you want to close out with? Uh, no, I don't think so. You know, um, like I say, you know, it was an honor, you know, to, to um, have had the opportunity to to, to, to be a trailblazer. And uh, I think back sometime now and just, man, just how did I do it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, but then, then I say, well, it was just the will of God. Amen. You know, so, mm -hmm. And keep moving on, you know? Amen. All right. But I just want to say I love each of you from the agape love from Jesus Christ. And that's what we got to have is love, love, love. Amen. And y'all keep on, <laughs> keep on trusting in the Lord because uh, he definitely brought y'all through. He was, uh, he sent angels to protect you guys, you know, and, right. and gals during this period of time. But thank y'all so much for this tonight. And uh, we give the Lord Jesus Christ the, the praise. And let, let, let uh, me just. Ronnie want to say something else. Let Ronnie. Okay. Mr. Sadler. Mr. Sadler. Uh -huh. when, I, when I came to Conyers, uh, I was in the sixth grade, but Sims class, and I couldn't have been no more than about 12. And, and, and I don't know how you can recall what bicycle I had. <laughs> well, you know, you know, uh, I was talking to one of my classmates the other night and I was trying to get him to recall something. Uh, and he could he said, man, I can't remember all that stuff like you do. So there are, there are three people that I know uh, that grew up with us that probably got uh, somewhat of memory of a, a quote unquote an elephant. That's Aubrey, Jerome, Levin and myself. Uh, I don't know why. I, I guess maybe uh, one of the things that might be, um, I guess I inherited from my mother because my mother was a person who remembered a lot of stuff. And uh, she would often, you know, tell me stuff. She could give me history and stuff. And, and, I didn't, and Aubrey, no, I didn't really like history uh, for a number of years and everything. But I don't know, some of this stuff is just kind of easy to, to remember and everything. Now, there are probably a lot of stuff that I don't remember, but there are certain things that just just stand out. And, uh, and that, with you on that bicycle, because uh, now I guess the one reason why it stood out, because most of us didn't have that kind of bicycle. Okay, uh, okay. You had bicycle with gears on it and handbrakes. Oh, okay, okay. And so we didn't have that kind of bicycle. So it was <laughs> it was stand out, you know. So yeah, what, you talking about, what you're talking about was in 1960. I recall that. That was a milestone in my life. And, and when okay. I came it was 1960. You know how many years that's been? <laughs> yeah, I know, but you know, I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> and, and, and Aubrey and I will, uh, when we get on the phone a lot of times, we'll go down memory lane and be talking about all the different stuff, you know, and everything. And and so, um, and he and I started, I think I was in the fourth grade, we started carrying the Atlanta Day to the world. And we were delivering around on Fridays and Saturdays and stuff. So we got a chance to meet a lot of people and, and they would tell us a lot of stories and stuff. And a lot of this stuff, I just, I just remember. And, uh, Course, I've had people tell me, you know, often that man, you ought to write a book or whatever, all this <laughs> stuff is in your head. And that's why, you know, I'm doing these kind of things right now is to to put something some of this into um um in a media form that hopefully will last a lifetime. And uh, so uh when I get this uh finished and everything, I'm gonna share it with you guys and, and y'all will be able to pass it on to your, your family and stuff, and, and they can hear the stories that, that you told and everything, but thank y'all so much, man. This this is great. I, I appreciate y'all, and um, I love each and every one of you, so good night, and this is going to end our recording. Thank y'all, Facebook people, and okay. YouTube folk for watching this tonight. Thank you, and God bless each and every one of you. I tell you what, before we go, let's, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, we give you the praise, oh God. We we thank you for bringing Aubrey and Ronnie and and Lamar and all the rest of the trailblazers through, oh God. We thank you for protecting them during that time because you knew on this night, 
Uh, yeah. February the 17th, 2021, we were going to do this recording, even when they were in school. And God, you kept them safe. You blessed them and you protected you, them. You let them multiply. And now there's multiple generations from each one of them. And Father, we Thank just want to give you the praise. We want to give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus Amen. Name. Good night. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Be good. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.